Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Asymptotics and Perturbation Methods. Today, we're going to venture out into the world of partial differential equations for the first time, just a brief little foray. Um, since a number of you have asked to see how perturbation methods can be used in that context, and they certainly do get used there a lot. I mean, that's um, one of the main applications, but uh, that's probably really better in another course. Still, just to give you a taste, I thought I would do one example that um, comes from a book by Jim Keener that I like very much called Principles of Applied Math. And so let me just dive right in to that. Okay, here we go. Actually, Bender and Orsog don't really do any partial differential equations. And since we've been sticking to that book mostly throughout the semester, that's one reason we haven't gotten into it yet. Um, Holmes's book, Mark Holmes does have partial differential equations. So that could be a place you could learn about them. And Bender and Orsog had planned to include them in a, a second book, but Orsog has passed away, unfortunately. And, Bender is getting pretty long in the tooth. I don't know if he'll ever produce that second volume. In any case, our topic, as I say, comes from Jim Keener's book, Principles of Applied Math, now in several, at least the second or third edition. Um, I'm working off the first edition, where on page 530, he gives this example that um, has to do with the propagation of a flame. So, it's a simple model for flame propagation that is apparently a classic in chemical engineering. Um, it's not something I'm really too familiar with, so I'll do my best to get the physics and chemistry across, but uh, I don't promise uh, I'm totally accurate on all of this. All right, but anyway, so I'm gonna write down some dimensionless equations for this flame front model. And um, in Keener's book, he shows the original dimensional equations and then scales them in detail. So if you're curious about the scaling, you should check out his book. But so in dimensionless form, the quantities we're gonna consider are, um, we'll have space and time. That's what's making it a partial differential equation. We've got two independent variables. Um, we're just gonna think about a one dimensional space. So propagation along a line and um, we're going to keep track of two dependent variables, which are the temperature at each point um, along this one dimensional line, also as a function of time, and the changing concentration of gas, the fuel that's being burned as the, um, the flame is propagating. So, you know, you can imagine how this works. In regions that are hot, the fuel catches fire, ignites, starts to burn. Um, that liberates heat that can change the temperature, right? So you can have this coupling between temperature and gas concentration. And um, together they can lead to this wave of burning propagating down the line as unburned fuel gets consumed and catches on fire and burns. So that's basically what's going on. Now, in the course of non-dimensionalizing, Keener shows that certain dimensionless parameters enter the problem. Um, there is a relatively small parameter epsilon that in the chemical engineering literature goes by the name of the Zeldovich number. Um, it's a dimensionless ratio of certain energies involved in the problem. Uh, and there's a Lewis number that is a dimensionless ratio of diffusion constants, the rate at which uh, heat diffuses compared to the rate at which um, the gas can diffuse. So you've got two different diffusions. Those ratio give you this dimensionless Lewis number, which we're not gonna assume that's necessarily small or big. That's just some order one parameter L. Now here's the part that I, we should probably concentrate on just for a minute or two. What are the scaled equations for this problem? Um, in the Zeldovich model, they look like this. Let's just sort of walk through the various terms. First of all, you could think of them as two coupled heat equations or diffusion equations probably more properly. 
So you've got, remember theta, think of theta as being like T, that's like temperature. So you've got the, the rate of change of dimensionless temperature depends on how heat is diffusing. That's this term, second derivative of temperature with respect to dimensionless space. But also heat can um, be generated at a given point, xi. So xi is our dimensionless space variable, this, this crazy Greek letter, xi. Um, heat can be generated at this point because of the release of heat through the reaction where um, the fuel is, is catching fire. So you have a reaction in which there's a rate of reaction. That's what this F of theta is. I'll talk about that in a minute. F of theta times the gas concentration Y at that point. Um, and then this dimensionless quantity that is uh, very large, one over epsilon squared. So anyway, think of this as the term corresponding to the heat generated by the reaction. Whereas this term in the gas equation is showing us that the reaction is consuming the gas, Y, at the same time as it's generating heat. Meanwhile, the gas itself can diffuse and it, it's got this kind of diffusion with in this dimensionless form, the, the Lewis number entering here. So as I say, two coupled diffusion equations coupled through this nonlinear term, a y times an f of theta. Now we should talk about the f of theta because that's where all the nonlinearities are. So the f of theta has to do with uh, this chemical reaction that causes the burning. And, um, or maybe I should say the reaction rate. I mean, the, the rate of reaction is dependent on the temperature theta, where things have been scaled so that a theta of one corresponds to the dimensionless temperature at which the gas would ignite. And so there's essentially no reaction happening at low temperature. It's only when you reach ignition that, um, that the reaction happens. So you should think of this blue curve, this F of theta, as being essentially zero, except in some thin layer centered just below one, okay, at which the, the ignition occurs. And so there's a formula for this F of theta that comes from the Arrhenius law um, for rate of reaction in chemistry. And so in scaled form, um, this Arrhenius law gives you a rate of reaction F of theta that's the exponential of temperature minus the critical temperature divided by this epsilon. So this whole thing, this you can see this term has got something that is gonna become significant when theta minus one is um, comparable to epsilon, when you're in a width epsilon around one. But otherwise, if theta is less than one as it is here, we're not gonna have temperatures higher than the ignition temperature. For theta is less than one, this numerator is negative, which is producing a negative number over an epsilon. So you're getting something that looks like e to the minus, you know, say e to the minus something over epsilon, that's gonna be a transcendentally small term. You know, that's gonna be sort of like e to the minus infinity is what I'm trying to say. So that's gonna be basically negligible. There's basically no reaction happening except in regions that are close to the ignition temperature, which sort of I think should make sense physically. Um, Meanwhile, it turns out in the Arrhenius law, there's this other term that is not of any great importance, but it's in there. There's a dimensionless parameter gamma that we don't need to think about and um, a, a slight dependence on theta. Of course, there's this theta minus one term, but um, this is really not the, the term of great interest. It's this that matters. So as I say, there's a width of characteristic size epsilon about uh, and just below theta equals one. That's my rate of reaction, um, quite nonlinear with that exponential. And that's it. So, I mean, now the problem is set up, um, except I want to say what, what it is we're interested in calculating. I mean, intuitively, you should think of this being a wave propagation problem, that if you have a region that is hot, 
and starting to burn, then you would expect that burned region, that burning region to heat up neighboring unburned regions and potentially make them catch fire. Like think of, you know, fire propagating along a fuse or something, if you want to visualize something. So um, I picture it as this flame propagating into the unburned regions, causing them to catch fire and causing further propagation. And so we want to know how fast um, this traveling wave of burning actually goes. What is the wave speed is the, the natural question. I mean, we'd also probably like to calculate the wave shape, um, both for the consumption of the fuel and for the temperature as functions of time and space. But especially the wave speed is the question of interest. So to be a little more visual about it, um, here's what you might guess very qualitatively of what the picture might look like. Now, actually the details of what I'm gonna show you right here are wrong. Uh, we're gonna see that they're wrong, but it might be your first thought um, that you might expect a picture of something like this. If you graph the gas in relation to the one dimensional space, the gas concentration, Y, then here where the, the flame has already passed through, this region is burnt out. So there's no gas left, this has been consumed. Over here, which where the flame hasn't reached yet, it's all unburned. There's plenty of gas and things have been non-dimensionalized so that this concentration is called one in the unburned region. And then there's some transition between them in the burning zone happening at C near zero. Meanwhile, as far as the temperature is concerned, um, you know, over here where the flame had gone, it's hot. And um, over here where the flame has not reached, it's cold. And right here in this burning zone, it's going from hot to cold, just ahead of the, the flame. Um, I suppose on a longer time scale, this part that was very hot will cool off, um, but maybe, I'm not sure. In this model, maybe we should think of it as still being on fire or something. I don't know, I guess it would be till all the fuel is consumed. But in any case, it's hot over here. Um, so what we wanna do then is look for a traveling wave propagating in this direction, right? Propagating from right to left. And um, we can see what boundary conditions we might expect intuitively that the Y variable should asymptotically be zero out here at large C that's positive. It should be one over here as C goes to negative infinity. And um, as far as temperature, the temperature will be, you know, at some reference level, which I think we set to, to one over here, uh, but it'll be zero far out at C equals negative infinity. So we're seeking a traveling wave with those boundary conditions. And I think at that point, uh, I have, I'm ready to start writing some new stuff. I mean, I should just say, so what's wrong about this picture? Well, we don't exactly know what's happening in this burning zone, you know, in here. Like we know that something sharp might happen at the flame front as the um, quantity epsilon goes to zero, as the parameter goes to zero. So we might expect something sharp, but what exactly? Not so clear. Like, do we think we might have, say, as far as why this upper variable is concerned? Do we think that maybe we'll get a sharp inner layer like this? where y jumps from zero to one, or maybe rather than an, a rapid change in y, we might get a rapid change in the derivative of y. So we might have a corner layer where y itself is continuous, but um, the derivative is jumping. So it isn't totally clear which, which we should expect here. It's gonna turn out that it'll be like this, the corner layer, but we'll see that in the course of our analysis. And that analysis will give us the wave speed. All right, so that is as far as I've pre-written. Now let me try to slow down and, and start writing some stuff. Do you wanna ask anything at this point? All right, so let's dive in. Okay, so since we're trying to think about a traveling wave, we want to go into a co-moving coordinate system traveling with the wave. That's the usual move in these wave propagation problems. And so um, 
let's introduce a new variable. S equals V tau um, plus C. So this is a traveling wave variable. That is, it's a it corresponds to a reference frame moving to the left at speed v, and um, you can see it's moving to the left because of this plus sign um, right here. If it were c minus v t, it would be moving to the right. I'm thinking of v as a positive number, and um, so this is a wave variable for a wave traveling to the left, as we think from the picture it should be. So this is moving leftward when the V is greater than zero. And the advantage of doing that, introducing this traveling wave variable is that it converts our partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations. Um, but keep in mind that the value of V is unknown at this stage. That's what we wanna solve for. So the value of V to be determined. Okay, so um, assuming a wave, the wave assumption means that we're going to assume theta is actually, rather than a function of xi and tau separately, it's only a function of xi and tau through this combination, vt plus xi, or v tau plus xi. Um, that is, think of it as, theta is only a function of this single variable s. As it keeps a constant shape, but it just propagates to the left at speed v. And same thing for the y variable. The assumption that it too is just a function of s is this wave assumption. And so um, we're gonna now express the PDEs in terms of this new variable s. Um, so to do that, we have to convert our derivatives. So for instance, we had a partial derivative of theta with respect to tau, and here's where you need to know how to use the chain rule. You would go d theta ds, ds d tau. And now keeping in mind the definition of s from up here, you can see that ds d tau is just v. So you should think of V as, actually, I probably technically ought to write these as ordinary derivatives, shouldn't I? Because theta is under this assumption, just a function of S alone. Um, anyway, so this gives me V times theta sub S. And likewise, if I wanna convert space derivatives, something like d theta d c is, well, again, theta only depends on s, and then I have to do partial s, partial c, which from this governing definition here, derivative of s with respect to c is just one. So I get theta sub s. And if I take one more derivative, um, which I need for my diffusion term, that turns out to just be theta sub SS. And similarly for Y variables. So the PDEs um, become uh, V sub theta S is theta sub SS plus one over epsilon squared Y times F of theta 
and the other one, the one for y becomes v times y sub s is that Lewis number L inverse y sub s s minus one over epsilon squared y f of theta. So that's our new system, um, which as you can see, these are now coupled nonlinear ODEs. Nonlinear because of that F of theta term. Um, and also because we're multiplying Y times a function of theta. So we have coupled nonlinear ODEs. We have an unknown V to be determined. And we should also keep in mind that we have boundary conditions, which come from the intuition uh, that I tried to express earlier about thinking about what the waves look like, roughly. That is, we can see where either y or theta is you know, becoming one or zero out at these extremes. So I can write down boundary conditions at plus or minus infinity, uh, which let's see, I don't have them on this page, but I guess I have to, oh, there we are. Um, so Y at infinity, Right, so over there, the gas is burned out. Y at negative infinity is still at one. Um, theta at infinity is one, but theta at negative infinity is zero. All right, so that's completely specifying the problem. Right, we've got the two, uh, we have second order equations in S, we have two boundary conditions in S. Um, so it's all there and now we should have a, a unique solution. Um, the hope is though, that in order to satisfy these boundary conditions, a V will be selected, all right? I mean, this should be enough to determine the V, we hope. So let's see how that goes. All right. Let's, um, do you want to ask anything at this stage? I don't think I understood the intuition for why we should think of theta and y as being functions of just the variable s. Oh, okay, right. Like, yeah. yeah, this is the idea of the traveling wave on sots. Right. So it's a customary thing in, in wave problems. Um, if you write something like a variable, like, I mean, in, in, in electricity and magnetism, if you ever take a course in that, you're constantly writing X minus CT. Um, and that's, so it takes a minute to think about it, but you should try to think of a coordinate system. Um, and then think about if I do something like X minus CT compared to something that's just X, that's just translating in the X direction by an amount CT. And that's, that corresponds to moving at a speed C for an amount of time T. So it's kind of like you've just taken the coordinate system and you're just moving it along, sliding it um, at a speed, in our case, V to the left. But otherwise, if to say that a function is only a function of S means that relative to this moving coordinate system, the shape of the function doesn't change. And so that's what it is to be a wave. It's a shape that doesn't change. It just translates at a constant rate in time. That makes sense, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I sort of have to think about it for a minute, like the signs, why is it plus V instead of minus V or whatever. But if you draw some pictures of two coordinate systems relative to each other, that will become clear. Okay, is there any other question? Would this trick with uh, the co-moving frame work for other types of PDs or just for these uh, moving uh, wave? It's specifically for traveling waves moving at a constant speed and, and assuming a wave that doesn't change its shape at all. So yeah, it's for the simplest kind of wave. 
Right. I mean, in general, PDEs are hard. And so to solve two coupled nonlinear PDEs is going to be tough in general. There aren't many tricks for that. So that's why we, you know, at least fortunately, we do have this trick for traveling waves. But um, beyond that, you'll, you'd have to take a course in nonlinear PDEs. And there's, you know, there are techniques, but I can't go into them here. And I, I can't say I'm really very well versed in them myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, this does come up a lot in epidemiology when you're studying a wave of uh, an, a disease propagating, you know, geographically, or um, in neurobiology, if you're studying the propagation of electrical activity along a nerve axon, th this kind of uh, wave transformation is used all the time. Same thing in electricity and magnetism. Any other place that waves occur, you'll run into this. Okay, anyway, so we've got this problem. And um, let me also just choose S equals zero to be at the natural place. I'm gonna sort of think of my S variable as being zero, you know, at this place of interest, right at the, where the transition is occurring. So we'll define, um, S equals zero as the position of the wave front. And we know that there's, I mean, sort of intuitively, we're thinking there should be some sort of layer So that's why we're dealing with this as a boundary layer problem. There's some kind of actually internal layer um, near S equals zero. So let's go into the usual layer way of thinking where we'll look for outer solutions on both the left and right side of this layer. And then we will try to patch the information together across the layer. And we'll have to work out an inner solution to do that. All right, so let's first look at the outer solutions. Those tend to be easier. And um, there are two of them. There's one on the right and one on the left. So let's start with the right side. Okay, so that's where S is greater than zero. Well, um, let's eyeball our picture again. So over here on the right, far out in this direction, you know, far away from the layer, kind of looks like we would want to take the y variable to be zero and the um, theta variable to be one. And let's just see what happens if we do that. Uh, if I stare at this equation, so what did I say? I wanted theta to be, like, let's just look at theta equals one. If theta is identically one, like it's just flat, this term would disappear, this term would disappear. F of theta would not disappear because F is behaving like this. F would be one at one. However, y, the y variable that's multiplying it, we're thinking that out here, y is zero. So this term y times f of theta, far out to the right, will be zero. Um, I mean, yes, this is a large number, but still, it can't beat a zero. So I'm just trying to argue that in the outer region on the right, theta identically equal to one and um, y identically equal to zero satisfy the PDE. You could check the other PDE as well. They satisfy the PDEs and the boundary conditions out at plus infinity. So those are gonna qualify as our outer solutions on that side. I don't want to make a big deal about them because we have to focus on the harder stuff, the inner solution and the solution on the left. So let me just take this as kind of obvious for what's happening on the right. 
Okay, so on the left, it's a little trickier to think about. Um, so now, what's going on on the left? Well, the thing to keep in mind is that we're going to think of the theta as being less than this burning temperature one. That that seems plausible, right? I mean, why would it suddenly get hotter ahead of the flame? Doesn't really make sense. So I, I'm going to just sort of take it as physically clear that theta should be less than one over here. I didn't write one, but let me, this is one. So I'm going to just assume that the theta is less than one. I hope that's plausible. Um, I mean, what would it be if it were not one? If not, um, we'd have a picture sort of like this. You'd have uh, what? So I have my temperature. I mean, I have a theta that's one over here. And then what do I think? Like it's somehow going to suddenly get greater before it starts going down? That seems weird. Um, seems implausible. Um, that theta gets hotter ahead of the flame. So we're going to just assume, as I say, theta is less than one, and we'll show that that's self-consistent and that that's actually right. So, um, so let's just assume that on the left. And if you think about that, then, um, well, I commented about this earlier. In that case, this function f of theta is going to be transcendentally small they give us a transcendentally small term because it's going to be of the form exp of minus you know something over epsilon if you'll remember because the f of theta which we had written back here Right, it's this theta minus one over epsilon. And if theta is less than one, we got a negative numerator. So I'm gonna argue that that's transcendentally small. And so it can be ignored on the left. There's no reaction happening far out to the left. The flame hasn't gotten there yet. Why would anything be reacting? So that's the idea. Um, so the flame hasn't arrived yet. So no reaction. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, I'm just gonna ignore the F of theta term. The Y F of theta term. And so in that case, the PDEs um, would give us well, or I mean the converted version of the PDEs the system which are now system of ODEs, let's look at them again. Here they are in the box. If I'm ignoring this term, I'm just getting something that looks like pure diffusion. This V theta S is theta SS and the same thing with diffusion of the fuel. Right, there's no burning, there's just a fusion of both temperature and fuel. So we have those little equations, which are now linear and, and very manageable. Um, the system just becomes V theta S is theta SS. And um, V sub YS is L inverse 
YSS. Notice, by the way, that they've uncoupled, right? There's no coupling between theta and Y anymore. Without the reaction, there isn't any. So it's just pure diffusion. And so those can be um, integrated easily. Um, you know, if we want, we could think about the whole thing perturbatively. We're not going to really need it. But just for the sake of introducing some notation I'm going to need later, let me let my theta be theta zero plus epsilon theta one plus et cetera. Um, same thing for y. And also let me expand this V, the unknown wave speed that I'm interested in as V zero plus some correction, epsilon V one plus dot, dot, dot. And so with all that in mind, the order one equations, oh, and also I'm gonna use prime as a shorthand for DDS. So with all that in mind, uh, my order one equations on the left are um, V zero, theta zero prime is just theta zero double prime. And uh, V zero Y prime or Y zero prime is L inverse Y zero double prime. So two really easy little ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients, linear. Um, incidentally, I have uh, a boundary condition suitable for being far out to the left. So let's remember what those are from my picture way back here. Um, we think that theta should be going to zero way out here and y should be going to one. So let's uh, notice those. So theta zero at minus infinity is zero and y zero minus infinity is one. Okay, so now just solve those equations. We can integrate um, theta zero pretty quickly twice and um, you'll find that theta zero as a function of S is of the form a constant A times E to the V zero S plus a constant I'll call C. Um, and well, I don't know, maybe I should call it C1. I'm gonna have a bunch of constants. Uh, so let's see. So now if I take S out to negative infinity and impose this boundary condition, this term as S goes to negative infinity gives me this whole thing is zero. And since this whole expression is zero, I get C1 is zero. So let's just say it this way, BC that implies um, zero plus C1 is zero. So C1 is zero. Okay, so I have theta zero of S is a function that looks like a e to the v zero of s. Now, in case you're a little bit worried for a second that this looks like it's exponentially growing, don't worry because remember s is negative. We're on the left. So this is exponentially decaying away from the origin. That's exponential decay away from s equals zero as s uh, you know goes left. So that's reasonable. I mean it's hot right near the origin and then it's exponentially decaying away from that in heat away from there. 
into the unburned region. Similarly, you could solve for Y0 and you'll find that Y0 comes out to be another constant. Um, let's say C2 minus B, some constant B, E to the, comes out to be L times V0 times S, that L from the Lewis number in the earlier equation. And here imposing the condition that Y0 at negative infinity is one, that implies that my C2 is equal to one. So I get Y0 of S is one minus some constant B e to the L V zero S. All right, so we can draw pictures of those now and compare our outer solutions. I mean, we've got out, we've got solutions on the left and right. So let's put everything together. So the outer solutions should look about like this. Uh, let's do one for a theta and one for y. Actually, I'll just go at lowest order. So theta zero, y zero. So what we've shown so far is that we have theta zero, that's one over here. And on this side, it's doing a e to the, this number is a, whoops. A to the, um, what do we call it, v zero s something exponentially decaying like that. And on the right, the theta, the y zero was just zero. No, barely visible. Let me move that up. Well, all right, whatever. <laughs> so that's supposed to be zero. And then uh, it's doing one minus b, this, this expression up here. So that looks like so. It's exponentially, you know, asymptoting to some level um, of one out here. And it hits this axis at one minus B, or as I say, that other one hits at A. So you can see what it looks like I've got here is some kind of jumping. And I don't really believe in that jumping. I mean, I think what this is trying to, especially because I don't believe that A should be greater than one um, for the physical reasons I gave earlier. So you can sort of see that just for the crudest kind of matching, not even thinking about the inner solution yet, it looks like this is pointing towards some kind of corner layer. And it looks like it's trying to tell us that um, we should set A equals one to match in this crude way um, set A equals one and B equals one. So that this is now making a continuous uh, choice for my theta zero and y zero. Um, so that's giving me my solutions now. That, that tells me the outer solution at lowest order, theta zero of s is e to the v zero s and y zero of s is one minus e to the l v zero s. All right. 
Now, um, as I say, the pictures, just a couple of little notes at this point. Um, the pictures are suggesting a corner layer. at s equals zero, that's one thing. And the other thing is with the choices we've made, you see from this picture that, you know, if I set the a to one, my theta zero really is exponentially decaying away from one and the theta really is less than one on the left, which is what I assume to begin with. And the whole thing is then self-consistent. Doesn't mean it's true, but it's plausible. Um, it's a slightly rough argument. I'm not giving you the most rigorous argument here, but it is correct, I think. So, um, so just as this, this other note, theta zero is less than one for S negative, um, as we'd hoped and suspected. So the whole thing is self-consistent so far. Okay, but what is remaining is um, we still don't know V. So V is not determined yet. And not really a surprise because we haven't taken the chemical reaction into account yet. So we left out some key physics, but um, so to get in there, we have to deal with the, the hot spot where the burning is happening. And that's where we're now gonna enter the nonlinear region where we have to really get serious and try to understand what's going on with the inner solution. And try to match it to this outer solution that we've developed so far. Okay, I'm just gonna stand up for a second and stretch, get some, fortify myself. Uh, right, see with partial differential equations, you've got to, you need extra, <laughs> extra resources. I know the people that do PDEs think those of us that focus on dynamical systems and ODEs are wimps. And I think they're probably right <laughs> compared to them, but okay. All right, so anyway, inner solution. Um, maybe you want to ask anything at this point before we dive in. Still with me? All right, we've got these pictures, yeah. All right, so let's try. Here we go. The inner solution, what, what do we need to do? Well, um, so to find V0, we need to match more carefully. Uh, near s equals zero. All right, so as I say, we left out this term, the one over epsilon squared y times f of theta. Um, we know that that becomes significant near s equals zero. So we can't neglect it anymore. And actually, when we say near S equals zero, we really mean specifically for um, S sort of of the order of epsilon or smaller. And how can we see that? I mean, why do we know that that's a reasonable scaling? Well, I would say, you know, we could, we know for one thing that theta, you know, if we look at f of theta, the way f of theta was written back here, or was it? Man, oh man, a lot of writing. Where's the darn f of theta? Here, this f of theta, we know that as far as the theta is concerned, we're interested in thetas that are within epsilon of one from that term. 
So how does that translate into space or into the S variable? For a theta to be within order epsilon of one, if you come back and look at the picture that we now believe in, this picture, where, I mean, this has now been matched so that it really should look, maybe I should draw a picture like this. What I'm trying to say is that in the neighborhood of this point, when I've done the correct matching, my theta is gonna come down linearly at some non-zero, but also not infinite slope to the left of this point. That is the picture is, maybe I should just draw it here. Let's do it like this. Um, if I draw theta versus S with what I believe to be the case, it looks like one and then something that exponentially decays. And I wanna put up my new origin in here. I want to focus on what's going on near that corner. This is theta versus s. And so you can see theta looks like it's behaving linearly with s on this side of the corner. So since I was interested in a theta within epsilon of one, I'm also going to be interested in s's within epsilon of zero. Right? That will allow for nice linear behavior to, to be captured. So I, with this kind of argument, I'm suggesting, um, I mean, also for that matter, if I look at the other variable, if I think about how Y is behaving with respect to S, remember it's also got this linear behavior on the left side. So all these things lead me to introduce new variables that have, um, I'm going to do a space scale that's stretched. So eta is going to be S over epsilon. That's my inner variable for space. And I'm going to let um, the deviation from one in theta, I'll scale that with epsilon two, call that epsilon phi. Right, but this is all this argument that this side is sort of linear to first order. And we saw that deviations of theta by an amount epsilon from one were the key thing. So that's why I've done this. And similarly, I can choose a Y to be um, epsilon times a new variable U. So I've tried to motivate the scaling with these considerations. Um, you could just go blindly and poke it, you know, you could put in scalings with epsilon to the alpha and, you know, I mean, you could sort of do it algebraically without thinking, but I think it's pretty clear if you just think about it. So anyway, those are reasonable choices of scales. As I say, this is all suggested by the form of F. And when you make those changes of variables, well, um, let's see what will happen then. Actually, I think there's one more picture I wanna draw that might help you get some intuition, which is, um, I've drawn a bunch of things here. I drew theta, like this picture, theta versus S, I'm sketching it. I'm showing Y versus S. And it's also appropriate to think about this magic function F. I mean, what is that looking like? The rate of reaction. Let me sort of draw it underneath to keep everything in parallel. The reaction rate. Uh, it's gonna go off the page. I'm gonna move that down a little there. So the reaction rate F of theta, where theta is a function of S, viewed as a function of S, 
What is that going to look like? Well, um, remember that f of theta, we, we have this picture. That's this in blue back here. This is my f of theta. Right, it's pretty much zero everywhere, except then it rises sharply to one when theta gets close to one. So I have to look in my picture down here to see where is theta close to one? Well, all over here. So F is going to be close to one on that side. Um, whereas it's gonna be transcendentally small, we decided on this side. So the F is practically a step function. And why am I doing all that? Because there was a key term entering the, remember there was a term we neglected in the partial differential equations. And that term was a term that looked like this. It was one over epsilon squared y times f of theta. I'll think of all of those as functions of s. So I claim that from these pictures I've drawn above, I can now sketch qualitatively what this um, term that I previously neglected, what does it look like? I can now write it down. So to do that, what I have to do is take, I mean, look at its structure. I have to take the y times the f. So here's y, it's non-zero there, it's zero over here. Multiply that pointwise against f, which is one over here and zero over here with some kind of steep jump in between. So if you multiply those two things together, when I take a zero times or transcendentally small times this stuff, that's gonna be transcendentally small over here. And when I take this um, zero times this one, that's gonna be very small over here. But there's some place in the middle where the F has is sort of undergoing its rapid descent and Y is sort of not too close to zero that their product can actually be something. And so you'd expect a shape that's gonna be sort of like this. Or actually, I don't know, maybe I should, uh, I'm not so sure it's on both sides of the axis, maybe it's only in the front. But anyway, something kind of like that. By the way, its height is one over epsilon squared. So that could be big right there. Think of this as the flame front or the burning zone. So, so that's interesting. Okay, anyway, so that's the term. Um, and so now let me go in and try to, in the remaining time, figure out what's going on in the inner region. Okay. Um, I think actually while I'm here and I've got all these sketches, I wanna just make one further picture. I wanna simplify these pictures I've drawn for theta and y because I'm focusing on the inner layer. I just wanna kind of take what I see in here and blow those up sort of just thinking linearly, just thinking what, what is happening to lowest order. And so the lowest order picture, maybe I'm making a mess, is um, with these choices, you know, the choices here in this box, or I'm zooming in 
into the little blue region. You can already see what's happening, I think, that qualitatively what's happening is my fee. You know, now looking at these variables here these inner variables. I expect my fee to look, uh, let's see, everything's a function of eta, the, the inner variable. So I expect phi versus eta to look, basically, remember I've shifted the origin to here and here. So what I see is two straight lines meeting at an angle phi versus eta should look, maybe I'll try to emphasize it in color. I do this in red here and here, and this in red and here and there. Then my phi versus eta, because phi is the scaled version of theta, is gonna look like this and then zero. Whereas my, um, Uh, the other variable I'm calling u versus eta. That would be what I see in this picture and blow it up. It's going to look like this. qualitatively. I need though that kind of information when I do the matching. That'll be helpful to have recorded. I don't know, I hope the pictures were visible. You, you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Okay, so I've got that. Now, now that I have all my intuition going, let me start doing some algebra. So um, let's rewrite. Uh, one of these ordinary differential equations, V theta sub S equals theta SS plus one over epsilon squared Y F of theta um, using the inner variables. So I get, well, First is to transform derivatives. Theta sub S, that means D theta by DS, which in terms of the new variables is D of one plus epsilon phi all over D of epsilon eta. And when you clean that stuff out, the epsilons cancel, you get D phi by D eta. And I'll call this, um, eta prime, so phi prime. So prime is now gonna mean d by d eta. All right, so that's how the theta s transforms. Um, if you do theta sub ss uh, in the interest of time, well, all right, I'll just write it out. So it's DDS theta sub S, which is D by D epsilon eta. And then above, you know, I showed here that theta sub S is just D theta, D phi D eta. So um, I'm gonna substitute that in right there. Uh, and so I'm left with a one over epsilon phi double prime. Whoops. Okay, so now rewriting the differential equation, then that gives me V 
phi prime is one over epsilon um, phi double prime, that's converting the second derivative, plus, now let me look at this reaction rate term, one over epsilon squared, the y variable has become epsilon u, the f of phi variable, f of theta becomes f of one plus epsilon phi. And so if I sweep across my epsilons, I get phi double prime minus epsilon v phi prime plus u f of one plus epsilon phi all equals zero. So that's how the first differential equation gets converted. But now we're gonna be able to simplify that F term a little bit because watch what happens. I mean, that was the whole point of this scaling. F of one plus epsilon phi is equal to what? Exponential, so go back to the definition of F. It's exponential of one plus epsilon phi, that's my theta minus one all over epsilon. And then times that sort of irrelevant term, which ends up being one over one plus gamma epsilon phi. And so when you clean all that stuff up, the ones cancel, the epsilons end up canceling and you just get um, to lowest order in epsilon, this is just exponential of phi plus an order epsilon correction term that I don't need. So um, if I keep only the lowest order, actually, I could use just phi sub zero. Um, I mean, again, that if I introduce order epsilon corrections to phi, I'll get another order epsilon correction. So this is pretty nice. That is what's going on here. Let's look at what I've just said is, I have phi double prime, I have an order epsilon correction to it. I have u times this f, but I've just expanded f to be e to the phi zero. So the order one equation in the inner region we're getting just phi zero double prime plus u e to the phi zero equals zero. I'm oh, sorry, u zero. Everything else is higher order. And so we're making progress, right? I mean, you see how nice that became. And so I'll let you maybe as an exercise, check what happens with the other equation. But similarly, what you'll find at the, for the Y equation is that you get L inverse u0 double prime minus u0 e to the phi zero equals zero. So that's what happens to the other differential equation. And um, these two are so important that I'm gonna uh, give them some names. I'm gonna call these equations one and two. And Actually, you can see some nice stuff. If you add equations one and two, you can make their nonlinear term cancel out. So one plus two equals zero implies that what we're seeing is phi zero double prime 
plus L inverse U zero double prime is equal to zero, which you can integrate twice to get that um, I mean, those are just perfect derivatives. So integrating twice with respect to eta, you get phi zero plus L inverse U zero is some constant. I'm, I guess I'm now up to C three, but I'll just call it C one again. C one eta plus C two. And now here's where I wanna invoke those earlier pictures I wrote down. Remember I wrote down a picture that looked, I said it was worth understanding intuitively what's going on inside the layer that we have a picture that looks like this. This is the phi zero versus eta picture. And I also had a picture like this. for um, I guess U zero versus eta. We had those two pictures, but th so those pictures um, show a couple of things. One is let's think about some limiting behavior. Phi zero plus L inverse U zero, that should go to zero as eta goes to um, plus infinity, right? Because both curves are zero on that side. Both lines are zero on the right. And also the same thing for their derivatives. I mean, those are both true. So using those facts, you can conclude that C1 and C2 have to be zero above. And so we're just left with the fact that phi zero plus L inverse U zero is just equal to zero. Very pretty. And so we can, there's, in other words, we've now eliminated one in favor of the other. Let's do it this way. Phi zero is just minus L inverse of U zero. So one is just a scaled version of the other. That's pretty nice. Again, just in the inner layer we're talking about here. Um, okay, so I'm going a little bit over time because I need to do a bit of tricky analysis. But so for those of you who have to leave, totally understand it. It's a long and complicated lecture. Um, so go ahead and take off. But if you can stick around, I think this will take me just another few minutes. And so I'm gonna just finish. Otherwise you can just watch it on the, the video. All right, so let me finish this off. Um, with, now that I know that I got U zero in term, I mean, phi zero and L zero, that relationship between them, I can go back to my equation one and eliminate U zero. Right, I, let me get rid of U zero just in favor of phi zero. So, um, all right, so number one, becomes phi zero double prime minus L times phi zero e to the phi zero equals zero. That's our equation um, for phi zero, which is pretty nice because that's, um, we can understand, even though it's nonlinear, quite nonlinear, we can, it's a, in the form of a conservative system in the phase plane. It's of the form phi double prime plus a function of phi. It's almost like the function of phi is some weird spring. I mean, when I look at this, to me, it looks like, it looks like F equals MA, honestly. <laughs> this, this is the F equals MA. This is the MA part. It's just a mass of one. Here's an acceleration term. And this is a force that only depends on displacement. 
So it's a kind of weird spring. So it's really in a, basically an F equals MA, which will obey for a conservative system, a conservative spring. It has a constant of motion and energy. And so we can integrate this by the usual trick um, for dealing with conservative systems, which is if we multiply through by phi zero prime, and integrate, so just to say this is a conservative system. So if I multiply through, let's see, I get, um, well, let me just write it out if you're not used to this trick. Phi zero prime, phi zero double prime, minus L phi zero, E to the phi zero, phi zero prime, all of that is zero. And that's of the form d d eta of one half phi zero prime all squared plus something um, is equal to zero. Now, what is that something? So it turns out you have to, I mean, you could integrate it in Mathematica. It's basically how do you integrate, I mean, I'm claiming this is a perfect derivative of something. It's not obvious exactly what it is, but it's sort of like x e to the minus x. You have to integrate that, or I don't know, it's something like that. So anyway, you could do it with, a, if you were good at math team in high school, you could do this integral. Let me just tell you what it comes out to be. Um, it actually wants to be a negative sign here. And we'll get minus L phi zero minus one e to the phi zero. D d eta of that comes out to be zero. So let me grab this and copy it. This is then the expression inside is a constant. So let's duplicate that, move it down here. So this equals a constant. Let's call it C. You can see I'm abusing the letter C in this, <laughs> in this lecture. It's been used over and over. I'm up to like C5 by now, but let's keep calling it C. And we're all grown ups here. So now, how can I evaluate the C? Just notice one thing. As eta goes to infinity, I have some nice information. Go back to this picture up here, this simplified picture. If you look at this, as eta goes out to positive infinity here, we know phi zero becomes identically zero. So using that fact, um, so we get, and also so does phi zero prime. So we get one half times zero squared minus L times phi zero minus one is zero minus one. And then E to the phi zero is E to the zero, which is one. So all of this is equal to C. And if you clean that up, this tells me that um, L equals C. So my constant is just this Lewis number L. And so again, making use of the grabbing functionality of notability, I'm gonna grab this, copy it. No, I meant to duplicate it, darn it. Duplicate, pull it down here. All right, so now C is equal to L. We decided. There, so this is a very pretty expression. I mean, I have a lot of information about the unknown function phi zero of eta right there. This effectively defines what's going on in the inner region implicitly, it's all there. You know, in principle, we could try to integrate by integrating for phi zero 
separate variables and integrate, it will be nasty. But we don't need that if all we're interested in is the velocity. Remember, we were trying to figure out what's the wave speed for this traveling front. And so I'll show you a nifty trick now for calculating the velocity without having to integrate for phi zero. And then we'll finish. So um, how do we do this? We have our phi zero. We, we had this picture. Um, I mean, what have I used? I used, all right, let's think about this for a second. What's, what's remaining here? Wow, a lot going on in this darn problem. Um, basically, I think, you know, back in this picture, we were focusing in here, we've used information about what's happening going out to the right. You know, we just used that. We have not used this information here on the left. And that is what's gonna control the velocity. So what I need to think about is how to match these straight lines to the outer solutions. So I have to think about the slope of the outer solution coming in towards S equals zero and the asymptotic slope of these functions phi and u as I go out to negative infinity. That's the matching that I wanna do on that side. Because you know I've got a corner, I have to match both going out to the right of the layer and to the left. So what's remaining is um, finish the problem. By matching the slope uh, phi zero prime at negative infinity to the incoming slope from, uh, you know, from the outer solution. From the outer solution on the left. So here's what I mean. Um, if you look at the picture for phi zero, which picture? This one. You can see that the phi zero is just going out to negative infinity as I go, uh, as eta goes out to negative infinity. So my phi zero of, uh, Eta, I'm claiming goes to negative infinity as eta goes far to the left to negative infinity, which means that this term e to the phi zero that keeps coming up in the expressions, that is gonna to go to e to the negative infinity, which is zero out there. And so I can get rid of that nasty term in my energy. That is, I'm claiming this term disappears, becomes X transcendentally small as I do the match. And so I'm just gonna have one half phi zero prime squared has to equal L. Um, That is, this is at negative infinity. So phi zero prime at negative infinity is um, the square root, well, let's say plus or minus the square root of 2L. Maybe, maybe it's a little clearer if I say, rather than equals L, I should say goes to L. Because this is all in the limit as eta is going to minus infinity. All right, so this is an important observation. And we're almost done. 
Now it said plus or minus, which one is it? So if you look at the picture again, you can see how much mileage I'm getting out of this picture. You can see the slope is positive. So I want the positive one. I mean, this picture. Right, that thing shows. Um, we want the plus square root. Right, this is a positive slope. All right, so I'm claiming phi zero prime at negative infinity is positive square root of 2L. Now, what does that do for me? Well, that has to agree with what I'm getting coming from the outer solution. So what is the story with the outer solution? Well, um, I mean, this must, this must match to the slope um, from the outer solution, which the relevant slope is theta sub s. Actually, theta zero, we're only at lowest order. We only need the lowest order outer solution. So what was that? I mean, okay, wait, I should probably be a little bit careful. Theta zero sub S I'm claiming is the same thing. We derived this earlier. Theta zero sub S is the same thing as D phi, this inner variable the eta. I had that, where was that? I think it was back here where I was changing. Yeah, you see it right here. I marked it in blue. Theta sub s is d phi d eta. That's the translation from outer slopes to inner slopes. And so, um, theta zero sub s is this d phi d eta and this is just what I'm calling phi prime. Right, this is, if I take this out at eta equals minus infinity, whereas here, I want to think about this as s goes to zero from the negative side. So what is that expression for theta zero sub s? Well, we have to just go back to our old formulas. You'll trust me when I tell you that it was, that we're gonna end up taking DDS of what was e to the V zero s. If you look back, that was the outer solution. I have to evaluate this at, as s goes to zero minus, but this whole expression is V zero e to the v zero s. And evaluating that at s equals zero gives v zero. <laughs> Unbelievable, huh? Um, so what? So what did we do? We just showed that the traveling wave speed is square root of 2L. Man, that was a lot of work. But there's a lot of fun ideas in there. I hope you'll agree. Um, you know, I mean, we use a lot of the techniques in this course, matching, corner layers, all kinds of stuff. So here was a case where we could um, get everything we wanted by, you know, the techniques we developed, even though it was a partial differential equation. So if you're curious about what this means physically, you should, I recommend you go back and look at Keener's book. He re-dimensionalizes everything, puts everything back in dimensional form. And, and sort of explains what this means about the energies and the other parameters in the problem. But anyway, okay, hope you enjoyed that. Sorry to go way over time, 15 minutes over. Um, I better call it a day. <laughs>
All right, thanks. And I'll see you next time. It's our last lecture, next lecture coming up. So I'll see you then.